Hello and welcome everyone. We'll just give um, you guys a couple more minutes to roll in progressively and to join this web space. Some of you might have some issues connecting, so we'll just wait a few more minutes to give you enough time. But for those of you who made it so far, this is the, this is the place to be. You made it. So just wait a little longer and we'll, we'll start. And maybe as a head start already for those of you that are German native speakers, you can change the language on that little globe button down below on the right hand side. You can click on the German flag and you can switch it to German. Und jetzt sage ich es noch mal Deutsch. Also für alle Deutschsprachigen, die gerne ähm, auf Deutsch das, das Webinar hören möchten, bitte die deutsche Fahne anklicken. Unten rechts unten ist ein kleiner Globus und da kann man die Sprache Deutsch auswählen. Ähm, wenn man es sich anders überlegt, kann man auch immer wieder zurück switchen ähm, zu Englisch. Das ganze Webinar wird auf Englisch stattfinden. And again, for the English speaking fellows, welcome, thank you for joining. Um, we'll wait maybe one more minute or two more minutes for all the participants to roll in progressively. For those of you who would like to listen to that web conference in German, please click on that globe symbol and uh, click on the German flag and it will be translated simultaneously into German. We still have more participants joining in. But the curve is flattening with new arrivals. So I think I'm gonna start now officially. So hello, welcome, herzlich willkommen to everyone um, to this online conference. My name is Lisa Kuch. I'm glad that you're joining um, from all over the world to exchange on that important topic of the nexus between uh, fossil fuels, plastics and the climate. I myself am today speaking to you from Paris, but I'm usually based in Brussels, where I work for the Heinrich Böll Foundation European Union office. And the Heinrich Böll Foundation is the German Green Political Foundation that is affiliated with the Green Party represented in Germany's federal parliament. Um, I am the head of the International Climate, Energy and Agricultural um, Policy Program. And as such, I have worked on different issues around the EU Green Deal. And we will come back to that EU Green Deal for sure throughout this web conference. Um, the co-organizers of this webinar um, is the Deutsche Umwelthilfe, the Environmental Action uh, Germany, which is an NGO that um, works for environmental protection and consumer protection. And uh, this web conference was also co-organized by um, Food and Water Action Europe, which is the European program of Food and Water Watch, um, an NGO that champions healthy food and clean water for all. We also had some support from the Break Free from Plastic movement, which is a global movement that um, envisions a future free from plastic pollution. Um, before we start content-wise, I um, will briefly walk you through some technical tools uh, in order that 
for you to fully benefit and enjoy that webinar. Um, I know that with the ongoing crisis, we all have had some uh, webinar experiences, I think, but um, it's always good to recall some uh, very basic functions. So as I said, language, you can switch on that little globe thing. The entire conference will um, be in English, but um, you can switch between languages um, whenever you want. We also have the questions and answers section. Um, it's right next to the participant symbol. So if you have any questions to the panelists, please ask them in that questions and answers section. Um, they can be related to the content of the presentations that we're going to hear. Um, if you need some clarification, uh, if you didn't understand something on the slides, you can drop that um, question on the questions and answers section and I will allow a maximum of three questions uh, after each presentation. And for the more debatable questions, um, we will reserve them for the end, um, for the panel at the end. But you can also put them in the questions and answer section. And another fun function of that is that you can like questions that other participants have asked. Um, it kind of works like a, a, a Facebook thumbs up. Um, and the more likes a question gets, the higher up it pops up um, at the end of the question and answer section. And I will obviously take that into consideration uh, when I forward these questions to our panelists. Um, we also have the chat function, which is right next to the questions and answer section. It's kind of like a little speech bubble. The quest, the, this chat can be used for all participants to exchange among each other. Um, you can share links. Uh, if you have expertise on something or something very interesting to share. And you can also um, use the chat to get in touch with uh, one of the participants directly and that um, message will then appear in red. Um, also note that the entire conference is recorded and it will be made available um, shortly after this live event on the co-organizers' websites. So, I see the first question, there will not be a coffee break. That might have been a test question. Um, we will have the entire conference and then we'll call it a day. Um, so let's start with uh, the content after having gone through all these technical issues. Um, we came together today to talk about the nexus of um, fossil fuels, plastics and the climate. Whereas more and more people have become aware of the plastic pollution problem, uh, the negative climate impacts of petrochemicals and especially plastics are still somewhat under research and under debated. And they represent a crucial blind spot for the EU in its plans for decarbonization. The EU has promoted um, fossil gas as a cleaner transition fuel and the US liquefied natural gas trade has been seen as a good way to diversify the EU energy supply. Um, however, there's now increasing scientific evidence that uh, fossil gas is spurring the climate crisis. And we have um, a high level participant on the panel that will uh, speak more about that. And the glut of cheap wet gas, so um, ethane, propane and butane, as a, as a result of that shale gas boom in the US has led to massive investments in um, petrochemical and plastic production infrastructure in the US, but also to some extent in the EU. Um, production of plastics in Europe is mainly based on NAFTA, so that's derived from crude oil. Uh, but one key player, Ineos, has started shifting from oil to gas for its feedstock and has also started to promote this shift um, as an economic perspective for the petrochemical industry in Europe. The problems with the end of life of plastics, as well as their negative climate impacts, make it imperative to reduce the booming plastic production. Um, instead, though, new facilities are planned in Europe, relying on these very same problematic supply chains. They are planned at a time where the EU has clearly acknowledged the need to reduce consumption of single-use plastics, and where um, the EU Commission has declared its Green Deal to be the overarching growth strategy for the next years. Um, the EU Green Deal consists of many different policy measures, um, ranging from biodiversity, transport, industry, energy, climate, etc. And the overall goal is to make Europe climate neutral by 2050. <clears throat> Investing in facilities now that will run on fossil fuels in order to produce virgin plastics goes against these um, policy goals 
especially as many of these facilities have a lifespan that goes way beyond 2050. And to these ecological and political problems um, comes now a financial one as well. The ongoing pandemic has exacerbated the financial difficulties in which the fracking industry has been for many years. And the oil and gas sector, sector may now uh, lean even more heavily on petrochemicals and plastics um, for their own survival. And the economic future of the sector is also far from being stable or secured. So in this web conference now, we will explore different questions. First of all, um, what is the climate impact of fossil gas? Um, what is the link between fracking and plastics? Um, why is the entire industry and plastic along their um, lifespan uh, so greenhouse gas intensive? What do current supply chain mean for uh, transatlantic relationships? And what is the impact on local communities on both sides of the Atlantic? Who suffers most from both plastic pollution and global warming? And what does the EU do in all this to tackle the issue? So lots of questions to answer. Um, before we start with the um, inputs from our panelists, I cordially invite two members of the European Parliament for some opening remarks to provide us with some political context. Um, first of all, I invite Jutta Paulus. She is um, a member of the European Parliament from Germany. Uh, she has been elected in 2019. She is part of the groups The Greens, EFA, and has herself a background in pharmacy. Um, she has since been serving um, on the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, and is also a substitute member of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy. And she's going to enlighten us a little bit more on the EU Green Deal, the climate law and the role of gas. So please, Jutta, the floor is now yours. Yes, thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak about um, what really has been on my mind for quite some months now, because um, as, as I came to Parliament, I was sort of astonished how um, certain scientific facts are just not properly recognized. Um, so coming to the Parliament, I'd like to focus really on, on methane, but I will not um, go through all the scientific details as we will have very, very prominent speakers on that who will share with us their latest insights. But um, I think what's important to know is that the current legal framework was written after the so-called gas crisis when um, Russia threatened to stop the gas supply and of course especially member states which are very much strong relying on, on Russian gas were pretty upset about that. So the, the key word back then was diversification. And everyone wanted to have as many possibilities to get this so-called bridge fuel um, as possible. And that's where all these um, pipelines and LNG terminals and all that was planned. And that's what we are finding now today when we are trying to um, make the Green Deal happen. Um, there has been a lot of writing about the Green Deal, and I would like to, to give you a short overview. Um, it has very good wording. There are good promises, but as always, the truth of the pudding is in the eating. Because the Green Deal up to now is only a communication. And the Commission has said, okay, according to this communication, we will change certain laws, certain regulations. And now we will be very closely scrutinizing whether the, um, the proposals which Commission will come up with will uh, really hold true to the promise. Um, Vice President Timmermans, who is responsible for the Green Deal, has been avoiding precise statements He's always a very strong um, rhetoric for the Green Deal. For example, right now in the COVID crisis, he says there must not be any chipping off of our goals and of our marks. But as I said, we will have to have a look at the proposals. And we had one very bad example. That was the PCI list, Projects of Common Interest. Um, this 
these projects of common interest are drawn up by the member states, so it's a bottom-up approach, but they have to be approved by parliament. And looking at this list of projects of common interest in the energy sector, there were some really good projects like batteries, like smart grids, like um, innovative storage, storage, but there were also um, almost half of the money should go into gas infrastructure. And at the end of the day, we Greens, we try to convince the, our colleagues from the other groups that the parliament should not approve the list, but it was approved in the end. And then Timmerman said, okay, um, but I promise I will make sure that all these projects are Green Deal proof, but there is no legal base for that. So we're pretty, we, we don't really trust uh, what he says because um, if he had said before we we were voting on the PCI list, that would have been a very much stronger um, a stronger signal if the parliament had said, no, we are not approving gas projects anymore. Um, what we see now, the gas lobby is doing extra hours. They're still talking of the bridge fuel. They're talking uh, on about a clean energy source even. And I think the English name of natural gas for methane is somewhat misleading for many who have no clue what natural really means in this case. Of course, it's natural. It's been formed in a natural fashion over millions of years. And now that we see the climate law has been published and is in discussion in the council and in the parliament, but it is not very strong. For now, we have an emission target for emission reduction target for 2030, which is now 40%. And the climate law says it should be increased to 50 or 55%. And the conservative groups have already said they want at the most 50%. But if we want to comply with the Paris Agreement, we should have, um, we should aim for 65%, which is also the position of the Greens and which is what's very good, also the position of the SND rapporteur Jutta Guteland, who has presented her draft reports saying she will call for 65%. Um, there have been a lot of discussions around the climate law because the Commission has proposed to set intermediate targets after 2030, um, which they would do using delegated acts so that the Parliament and the Council would not have to vote again on this. But I think all these discussions are just diversion maneuvers because it's the path to 2030 which is crucial. We should even have targets until 2030, because that would be an approximation to a carbon budget approach and also a distribution of duties between the member states. We don't have that for the moment. And one last point, the Green Deal is much more than climate neutrality only, because the Green Deal says we need to address the biodiversity crisis. We need to address the way we are um, using our resources. We are actually um, not, we are being not very efficient in that. We produce a lot of waste and we are not using our resources in a very efficient way. And so there's more than one link between, for example, plastics and gas extraction. We have the destruction of the environment in the USA, harming of biodiversity, and we have the creation of toxic waste of poisoned water. And during processing, we have these massive methane emissions which harm the climate. And um, I must say, I'm very, very glad that um, the European Environmental Agency set up this Copernicus project. Copernicus is a satellite which can capture all sorts of emissions worldwide. So due to Copernicus, we know that the methane emissions around the world are much, much higher than we originally thought, and that the human-caused emissions are as large as the whole emissions of Germany and France combined. I'm sure we will hear much more from, for, from that from the experts and um, I think Martin, I'm very happy to see you at least online, will tell you some more on plastics. Thank you Lisa for giving me the opportunity. 
Thank you so much, Jutta, for these uh, insights and your parliamentary work and uh, many issues that you touched upon, um, one of which was also uh, toxics, um, waste management, and how the circular economy uh, is needed and, and linked to climate goals. And without um, working on circular economy and also without reducing methane emissions that you also briefly touched upon, we cannot um, think about solving the climate crisis. Um, I will now invite um, Martin Hosik, and I hope that I pronounced your last name right, please correct me if I was wrong, um, from Slovakia, who, um, like Jutta, has been a member of the European Parliament since 2019 um, for the Renew Group. And just like Jutta, is also a member of Envy and ITRE. Um, as a former campaigner against Hazardous uh, Chemicals following REACH negotiations, he has established himself quite early um, on as a major opponent of the overuse of pesticides and also um, other highly toxic chemicals. So um, please, Martin, give us some insights into Circular Economy Action Plan, the plastic strategy. What is your take on that? The floor is yours. Uh -huh. Unmute. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, yeah, it was great to hear you again. Uh, the circular economy and the plastics is a really significant issue because, as Ita said, Green Deal is not only about climate. But one of the things that you know, environment is very clear about is everything is interconnected with everything. And uh, coming from uh, Slovakia, which is dependent on the Russian gas. I will first slightly divert to this issue of where the whole kind of gas uh, infrastructure is also coming from, from the gas crisis. This is because countries like Slovakia really are facing the challenge of, okay, what do we do if the Russians close the tap? At the same time, this has swung to the extreme opposition of, okay, now let's build all the terminals for importing of the uh, gas from the US. But both of them have this really nasty dirty secret of the methane emissions and this is something which we should not uh, forget about now when it comes now to the plastic uh for me what it seems like uh in the recent years is that the gas industry is starting to search for alternative markets they are seeing that okay there is a look, uh, the outlook of a decline of the uh, use of the fossil gas and i think we should be calling it fossil gas in the future so what we're going to do it when we're going to sell it uh, and the opportunity to turn the gas into plastics is for them clearly a new market. What is uh, the tragedy with it? One of the problems is that uh, you have a massive issue with the plastic waste. The diversity of the types of the plastic, including the use of uh, additives and lots of the additives uh, uh, in the plastic themselves are hazardous chemicals. Uh, is leading to a situation that we have a massive problem with the pollution. We have a problem with the dump sites and uh, we have uh, a perturbated solution, which is supposed to be not a circular economy, but often push for uh, incineration masks under the waste to energy. And when you look at it from this perspective, you would have a fossil fuel turned into material, turned into something which is attempted to be labeled as a renewable energy, but at the very beginning is actually burning of the fossil fuel. So this is one way that uh, the plastic uh, from in general, but also the, uh, the plastic from the natural gas is contributing in a hidden way uh, to the greenhouse gas emissions. Second, uh, developing new capacities for the plastic production, I think goes against the whole spirit uh, and the idea of circular economy. What I believe we need in the Green Deal is really to address how we can close the material loop and specifically uh, uh, in, in terms of plastics uh, within the European Union, how we can actually build up the value chains. So instead of seeing a new capacities for a virgin plastic production, what we should see is investments in recycling, investments in design where ultimately we shouldn't be doing any more virgin plastics. And this trend of hiding the fossil fuels, uh, hiding the, the CO2, future CO2 emissions in the plastic is something which I see going not only against uh, the climate objectives that we have, the climate commitments that we have, but ultimately going against the whole concept of circular economy. And I think this is a very dangerous trend that we need to try to prevent. 
And uh, it's going to be not only crucial on how the legislation following, for example, the circular economy strategy uh, is going to turn out, but it's going to be very also important to look at it within the whole framework of uh, uh, MFF, so the multi-annual financial framework of the union and the big discussions about uh, the whole hopefully green uh, recovery package because this is something where it's going to be crucial to see if we manage to exclude any in support from investments like these uh, so at the end of the day we don't use public money like we are facing what Utah mentioned in terms of the projects of common interest for building up uh, and supporting private investments into further utilization of a, of a fossil gas, turning it into a plastic and have, so to say, then a stockpile of uh, future emissions laying around, either ending up often in our seas and in our uh, countryside and uh, in our bodies, or being burned and releasing uh, more CO2 emissions. So it's really a challenging frontier and I'm looking forward to, to the inspiring discussions and thank you very much for organizing uh, this workshop. Thank you so much, Martin, for, for these insights. Um, and uh, we will now kind of start to travel along the supply chain and, uh, and lifespan of plastics. And we start off with uh, the source, with fossil fuel extraction. And I'm delighted to now um, uh, welcome on this, on this online stage, Professor Robert Haworth, um, who will explain to us um, his latest evidence on methane emissions and leakages of fossil gas. Um, Professor Robert Haworth is an earth system scientist and ecosystem bio biologist. And he has taught at Cornell University as professor of ecology and environmental biology since 1993. And among his numerous research interests are the global methane cycle, the role of trace gases in global warming and climate disruption, life cycle analysis of uh, greenhouse gas footprint of energy technologies and many more. And already back in 2011, he has published his first comprehensive analysis of the greenhouse gas footprint of shale gas which made a pretty big buzz. And ever since, he is one of the leading international methane experts. Um, and I'm very happy that he joins this conversation. So please, um, Bob, tell us more about your latest um, findings. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Let me uh, start my video here. Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. I'm, I'm, and I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, discussion today. I have a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation, so let me share the screen so everyone can see that. Hopefully this will work. How's that? Everyone can see that, can you? Seems to I be want to address yes. this. <laughs> Wonderful. I want to address specifically the role of, of uh, natural gas, or what Martin has correctly termed fossil gas, and methane and, and climate change. As Lisa says, this is something I've worked on for uh, a decade or more. So a quick summary here, if I can get my computer to work. So, so my context, of course, is the uh, Paris Accord, the COP21 Accord where all of the countries of the world agreed we need to keep the planet of the earth well below two degrees uh, from the pre-industrial baseline with a clear recognition that even approaching 1.5 degrees is, is dangerous. And, and what I want you to understand from that is that we cannot do that simply by reducing carbon dioxide emissions. If we're to reach the COP21 target, we need to reduce methane emissions. And my reason for saying that is, is highlighted in this uh, excellent study from Drew Schindel and others. Uh, Schindel is one of the lead authors of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And they published this paper eight years ago now. And what you're looking at is the global warming from 1900 up to 2011, the jagged line there. And then uh, four possible trajectories into the future, four scenarios. Keep in mind, we wanna keep well below that uh, uh, 1.5 degrees, the yellow there, and certainly we don't want to get near the, the, uh, the red part. So the top line, the, the 
scenario of no greenhouse gas reductions is what the warming uh, would be if since 2012 we've done exactly what we've done, which is not to, to take real action against any greenhouse gas emissions. We'd continue to warm. And in fact, the earth has been warming a little bit more rapidly than that model uh, predicts. So we are now uh, right about there. The next line down is what would have happened had we back in 2012 aggressively started reducing uh, carbon dioxide emissions, but had ignored methane. And it makes no difference for a long period of time. The climate lags to reductions in CO2 uh, emissions, in part because of ocean uptake and release. Eventually, slowing those emissions makes, it, makes a difference, but it takes time. We would blow right through 1.5 degrees in about 10, 10 years from now if we do that. The bottom two lines are what happens if we also undertake uh, efforts to reduce methane emissions and, and also uh, perhaps soot, uh, black carbon. So if we reduced only methane and soot, that's the line here. It slows the rate of global warming right away, although eventually those carbon dioxide emissions catch up with us. And the bottom line is what we want if we control methane, carbon dioxide, and soot. And if we do that, we actually have a chance of reaching the COP21 target. It's the only chance we have. So I just wanna uh, step back for a second and explain uh, why the scientific community was delighted that the political community at COP21 set these targets. And it's, it's because of our concern about tipping points in the climate system, fundamental things which will change. And I'm not gonna spend much time on this. There are many things in the climate system which could change as we warm the planet. And those may be irreversible. It might take hundreds of thousands of years or more to, to come back to the normalcy that society is depended on. And what I really want you to notice is that if we stay in the white, this is expert judgment from the IPCC back in 2007, the argument is if we stay in the white here, the chance of these tipping points is moderately low. As for each one, as we hit yellow, the tipping point uh, probability increases and red is, is very high risk for these. And you can see that, well, we're already at 1.1 degrees, so we're at moderate risk of losing Arctic sea ice, which of course has been happening. The one thing I wanna highlight on this is, uh, things are probably worse than we thought back in 2007. And I'll just quickly summarize this last one here. Uh, this has to do with changes in the ocean circulation pattern, particularly the uh, Atlantic Ocean, also called the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. And the thinking back in 2007 was we didn't need to worry about affecting this until we hit, oh, three, three and a half, four degrees Celsius. Well, in fact, at 1.1, we're already seeing changes. We have slowed the circulation of the North Atlantic Ocean measurably over the last two decades by uh, greater than 15%. That's due to melting of Greenland ice and melting of Arctic Ocean ice, which has changed the salinity in a very uh, mild way, but enough to change the, the ocean circulation patterns. And this is bad both because the ocean takes up a lot of carbon dioxide that humans emit from fossil fuel burning, and that rate of uptake goes down as this ocean circulation slows, as it's doing. And of course, the ocean circulation also is very important for climate. The climate we have in the Northeastern United States and in Europe is in large part due to the North Atlantic circulation. This is likely to become worse as climate change worsens, but the point is those 1.5 degree targets are very, very real. So with that context, let me, let me talk about this question, is natural gas or, or fossil gas a, a bridge fuel? And this is a topic that uh, I started thinking about very hard about a decade ago. The context for it, of course, the natural gas industry, uh, certainly here in the United States, but globally, and also the United States government, not only under Trump, but also under President Obama, very aggressively promoted this idea. And there's a, a bit of good logic behind it, which I'm showing you here. I'm looking at the uh, emission of carbon dioxide for a particular amount of energy that's released as we use natural gas, diesel, or coal. And coal does emit more carbon dioxide than does natural gas. Diesel oil is in between to get the same amount of energy. So if we were to move from coal to natural gas, our carbon dioxide emissions go down. But the problem with that is that natural gas, fossil gas is overwhelmingly methane. It's 90, 95% methane. And methane is 
uh, an incredibly potent greenhouse gas. For the time it's in the atmosphere, it's 120 times more potent than carbon dioxide in terms of its influence on warming. It's, it's half-life in the atmosphere is only a little bit over a decade, so its influence is, is on the decadal time scale, but it's a very, very powerful gas when it's there. So knowing that, I started to become concerned with what the shale gas revolution in the United States might mean for climate. And the shale gas revolution, uh, for those of you who haven't thought about it a great deal, there really was no commercial shale gas production in the world until this 21st century. And it's really taken off uh, in the last 15 years or so. Uh, if conventional natural gas, conventional fossil gas is methane, which might have originated in a shale formation such as this, but migrated through other geological formations over tens and hundreds of millions of years until it's capped under a, a steel and then put a well down and you just take it up. Well, the world's been running out of uh, conventional natural gas. The United States in particular has been. And the witness became the thought of the shale which remained, the methane which remained in the shale and extracting that. And it takes two technologies to do so. High precision directional drilling, where you drill a well down, find the shale, and then go laterally through it. And then high volume hydraulic fracturing or fracking, where you put massive quantities of water and chemicals in, you break up the shale and release the methane and it comes back. Still methane, but it's the methane that was trapped behind and never migrated. And on the right here, I'm showing you what's happened in the United States from 2000 to 2018. Very little uh, shale gas production until about uh, 2005 or six, and then it's taken off. Conventional gas production has gone down. Most um, fossil gas production in the United States is now shale gas. And I also want to em emphasize that there's a decent amount of shale gas production in Canada as well, but 90% of shale gas development globally has been in the United States, and 99 plus percent of it has been in North America. It's a North American phenomena. So what does it mean in terms of methane emissions? And Tony and Graffi and Rene Santoro and I took that on as a research challenge starting back in 2009, really. We realized no one else was thinking about this, so we did our best to pull together information on what the methane emissions associated with shale gas might be and what that might mean for climate. And we published this peer-reviewed paper uh, just over nine Years ago now, the very first paper ever published looking at the role of methane in the greenhouse gas footprint of, of shale gas. And our conclusion was this was of great concern. And I won't go through this in any, any detail, but, but we said uh, the information is that there could be a fair amount of methane emitted when you develop shale gas. And that when you consider the warming potential of that methane, well, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, shale gas may have a worse greenhouse gas footprint even than coal. That's what this figure in the top shows. Well, I'll, I'll come back to that conclusion later because there's better information available now. Bob, and one of our major sorry. conclusions was that... Bob, uh, yes. Bob I'm, I'm really sorry. I have to interrupt you very briefly. Um, we have some issues hearing you. So there was a suggestion whether you could maybe turn off your camera just to try whether your uh, sound is smoother. Uh, Would that okay. Be would that be possible, please? And also, um, um, I'm not sure if I can do that without stopping screen sharing. Can you do that? Oh, oops. Um, stop video. Well, there you go. Are you still here? Yep, I'm here. Okay, sorry. And would you mind um, putting a full screen mode on your presentation? Some yes, participants I could do had, uh, some I could participants while had doing trouble. Other, but you'll, okay, you'll have to bring some participants had yeah. just issues seeing the, the graphs. So sorry to yes, interrupt you. Yes, I can you. certainly, well, I can try to do that. Let's see, can I do that? Yes, I can do that. Thank you so much, Bob. Okay, thank, thank you for that, uh, that help. <laughs> uh, so, so let me proceed. One of our conclusions from 2011 was that we'd used the best available information, but it was extremely uh, limited, poor quality, poorly documented information. So we said this is of concern, but what we really need is a research priority for more scientists to get out there and measure information on methane emissions and do so in a way that's uh, free of industry control influence, quite frankly. And I'm, I'm delighted to say that's happened. Ours was the first paper. There are now uh, well over a thousand papers published in this area, 
hundreds with primary data. Uh, it's a robust area of scientific inquiry. I'm just giving you one example here, a paper we published in 2013. I'm a co-author of this, but it's typical of many others. We outfitted an, an airplane with equipment to measure methane in real time. We flew over part of the Marcellus Shale Formation in Pennsylvania, and the airplane's going back and forth relative to a observed drilling rig, in this case on the ground, and it's going up and down in the atmosphere. And you can see that the methane concentration is sometimes low and other times high. We can pull that information together, and there's a clear plume, which we integrate here, of methane rising out of this drilling. Out of this study, we found very high rates of methane emissions. We found a lot of surprises as to where it's coming from. Methane emissions from this study were higher than we had originally predicted. There are, are dozens of studies now, and I'm just gonna quickly summarize them for you here. So the numbers I'm giving you are percent of the amount of uh, production of fossil gas, shale and otherwise, in the United States back in 2015. And there are emissions at the production site and in gathering lines, and when you process the gas and store it and through high transmission pipelines, and the best estimate for that comes from the Environmental Defense Fund, Alvarez et al. paper published in 2018, and it works out to 2.4%. There's also emissions uh, in cities when you have local distribution of it, and the best information on that is a paper by Plant et al. from last year. They flew airplanes up and down the east coast of the United States to come up with a pretty robust estimate for that part. So the total life cycle emissions are the sum of those two, or 3.2% of the production. And I want to emphasize this is a low estimate because it does not include things such as uh, the high emissions we found in, in our airplane study, which were during the drilling phase. That's not included in this. Uh, and it doesn't include emissions from uh, abandoned wells. I don't think emissions could possibly be much less than this. They may well be uh, twice this. And I also want to uh, emphasize, and we'll get to this in a minute, that this does not include emissions from uh, LNG uh, movement to Europe. So, so just quickly, I mean, the scientific commun community knows that, that we're still underestimating methane leakage. And this is a quote from one of the lead scientists from Environmental Defense Fund just from last uh, November, confirming on the record, yes, that those are probably low numbers. And to give you a sense of how low they might be, this is a, a study published just two weeks ago, the latest work from Environmental Defense Fund, where they're using the Copernicus satellite data to look at uh, methane emissions in the uh, Permian Basin uh, from the southwestern U.S. And they say that this, uh, these upstream emissions from production and gathering and all, there are 3.7%, not 2.4. So again, the numbers I'm using are, are, are low estimates. But if we use those low estimates, we can look at the greenhouse gas footprint of, of uh, fossil gas, natural gas here, compared to oil and coal. And the uh, yellow color here are the direct emissions from using carbon dioxide when we burn a fuel. The red are the emissions associated with methane from using this fuel converted carbon dioxide equivalencies over a 20 year time period. And you can see that the natural gas footprint uh, is worse than coal, considerably worse than coal. I'll skip over that in the interest of time. Let me jump directly to uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas. It takes a lot of energy to liquefy it, and industry does that by burning natural gas. So about uh, to get one unit of uh, methane to Europe as LNG, it takes 1.2 uh, units of, of methane in the United States with, with 0.2 of those burned off and used in the United States to liquefy it. Of course, that dioxide emissions overall, it also contributes to the methane emissions. And on top of that, the liquid uh, methane during transit as LNG is kept cold by purposefully allowing some of the methane to evaporate. Evaporation cools us, right? That's what sweating is about. That's how they keep it cool. They purposefully emit some of the methane, letting it evaporate, and that's calling, called boil off. Industry claims they capture all of that and use it. There's absolutely no objective evidence as to whether that's true or not. We don't really know. But let's look at what LNG looks like. I've, I've taken my uh, previous figure here and simply expanded it for increased 
carbon dioxide emissions because of the gas that's needed to liquefy the LNG and the increased methane emissions associated with that. And you can see it has a very bad climate footprint compared to coal. And that does not include this boil off, this evaporation, which could be a great deal higher. There's simply no objective information on that. But LNG from a climate standpoint is certainly very, very bad, maybe horrendous. I want to step back and look just a little bit at the global concentration on average in the atmosphere from 1980 to the end of the century is going up. Concentration stabilized globally for about a decade, but since 2006 or so, it's been going up again rapidly. And of course, that's of concern because we need to reduce methane if we're to meet the COP21 target. And of course, what I think is going on is that uh, shale gas is a major driver of that. And almost two thirds of the total increase in fossil gas production globally over the last decade has been from shale gas in North America, again, primarily the United States. So it should not be a surprise that that would contribute to that global increase. And I can put a number on it using the figure I just gave you that conservatively at the low end 0.2% of, of net gas, shale gas production in the United States is emitted to the atmosphere. We know how much shale gas has been developed in North America. And that methane would contribute 35% of the total increase in methane from all sources globally over the last decade. And I, I told you that this number might in fact be twice as much. So 35 to 70% of the global increase in methane is from shale gas development in North America. Now there are, are those who argue otherwise, and this is a, a very high visibility paper published a few years ago in Science. They argue that no, it's, it's not fossil fuels, it's animal agriculture primarily, biological cows that might be contributing to the source. And they made that argument based on the carbon stable isotopic composition of the methane. So I showed you the methane concentration in the atmosphere globally in the top before. In the bottom, this is the amount of the heavier isotope, carbon-13, that is at the core of a methane molecule. And that's getting heavier over time, more carbon-13 in the 20th century. It was flat for a decade, and then it's been going the other way. So that's how they inferred that this was fossil fuels, that would be from cows. But there are a lot of problems with that. And I will just very quickly summarize those in the interest of time. I published a paper on this last summer, and I concluded that one of the problems is that they assumed that uh, the carbon signal, the carbon-13 signal in methane from shale gas is the same as from conventional natural gas. And there are reasons to believe that's not true. So again, conventional natural gas is methane that has migrated from a shale formation over say 100 million years. Some of that methane is chemically or biologically consumed uh, during those millions of years and that changes the carbon isotopic composition. So the methane which you get from shale gas has less carbon-13 in it than does conventional natural gas and this paper had not considered that. There are other issues as well in the interest of time. I won't go through those, but let me just give you the summary figure. Uh, this is the conclusion out of the uh, paper that says increase in methane emissions globally over the last decade. It's less than five teragrams. Teragram is a big, big number of methane. Less than five teragrams is coming from increased fossil fuel emissions and more than 20 from biological sources. With the corrections that I've made and others have made, we end up with a very different conclusion. Only about 10 of it is from increased biological sources and almost 20 is from fossil fuels with shell gas being a very, very major player in that. From that, we can estimate independently what the emissions percentage from shell gas might be, totally independent of the calculations I gave you before. And we end up with an estimate in the neighborhood of about 3.5%. Written long, as I said before. So I'm quite confident that we're emitting those types of, of levels of, of methane from shale gas. When we look at the global methane, 1995, there's about 570 teragrams per year, some from natural sources, but more from human sources. A lot of that was coming from oil and gas, a lot from coal, some from cows, animal agriculture, and other sources. 
over the last decade, we've increased that flux and we don't want to be increasing it. We need to decrease it. We've increased it by about uh, 25 teragrams per year. And that is principally due to uh, oil and gas with shale gas at very large from animal agriculture. So we're in the wrong direction in terms of our use of fossil gas. I'll end with that simply to remind you of this figure. If we want to hit the Paris Accords, we need to be decreasing methane emissions. We need to move very, very aggressive from all fossil fuels to do that, not only but particularly natural gas, fossil gas. And I'm, I'm really pleased to have had Pierre talk to you about this today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. And I'm really sorry for having you cut off um, uh, video wise, but um, the connection didn't seem to be the greatest. So nope. thank you for, yeah, thank you so much for um, this very insightful um, input. And I think it made us better understand um, why methane emissions have been underestimated for so long. And it's such a relevant topic because I think a lot of Europeans are rather wary of, of, of fracking, and yet they're not even aware of how much of that um, is imported and how much that business has grown in the past uh, two years. And we will now hear more about um, how plastics in more general contribute to the climate crisis as well, um, starting off um, with emissions uh, linked to fracking, but also emissions elsewhere that are um, oftentimes forgotten and un unaccounted for. And for that input, I invite Stephen Feit. He is an attorney in um, the Center of International Environmental Law. And he actually, had, uh, actually um, graduated from Carl University, so I wonder whether Bob, uh, you were his professor, maybe you can you can say something about that. Um, and then he did, a, a, and then he, uh, he attended law school. His work focuses primarily on climate liability and finance. And uh, Steve has been the co-author um, of reports that I highly recommend: "Plastic and Climate: The Hidden Cost of a Plastic Planet," and "Pandemic Crisis: Systemic Decline: Why Exploiting the COVID-19 Crisis Will Not Save the Oil, Gas, and Plastic Industries." And we will now hear about. Um, the, val the life cycle of plastics and their climate impacts. And I will ask you to share the video. There you go. Oh, I think I had on, there we go. Thank you so much, Lisa. And let me share my screen. Thank you so much uh, to everyone who's here. I'm excited to be here. My name is Stephen Feit. Uh, as Lisa said, I'm an attorney at the Center for International Environmental Law based in Washington, DC. And I uh, am going to talk about fossil fuels, plastics, and the planet. So setting us in time, what we see happening right now uh, is a massive expansion in the US Gulf Coast. Uh, ExxonMobil announced the largest ethylene cracker in the world. Uh, since this announcement, Formosa announced an even larger uh, plastics and petrochemicals complex. In the Ohio River Valley, we see the uh, industry pushing to become a second major U.S. chemicals hub uh, to recreate some of the Cancer Alley dynamics of the Gulf. And we are seeing shale gas being shipped from the U.S. into Europe uh, to make ever more plastics. You may have noticed that some of the names behind this expansion are familiar. ExxonMobil, Total, Shell, Chevron Phillips. And the reason, as we've discussed uh, already, is that plastics are fossil fuels in another form. Almost all of plastic is derived from fossil fuels, primarily oil or gas, a little bit of coal, but that is rare and happens primarily in China. And the reason that this is happening now is because the fracking boom has made natural gas really, really cheap. Uh, we covered this in our fueling plastic series, um, and it is driving a massive, massive expansion in new production capacity investments for plastics and petrochemicals. Last I checked, it was over $200 billion of announced investment uh, just for the US alone. But this is not a coincidence, this is the plan. Petrochemicals are set to be the largest driver of global oil demand growth 
through mid-century, with the World Economic Forum estimating that 50% of additional oil use between now and 2050 would be specifically for petrochemicals and primarily for plastic. So in, in the wake of this uh, rush, CL partnered with a number of fantastic organizations in the Break Free from Plastic movement uh, to trace the human health impacts of the plastic life cycle from its origin at the wellhead through product use, through disposal uh, and contamination in the environment. And then shortly thereafter, we partnered with another set of organizations to do the same thing for the greenhouse gas emissions of the plastic life cycle, tracing those emissions throughout the life of plastic to create a profile of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, of this material. The three main takeaways, if you don't remember anything else from this, one, greenhouse gases are emitted at every single stage of the plastic life cycle. Plastic pollution is a significant and growing threat to the Earth's climate. And then as a corollary, stopping the expansion of petrochemicals uh, and plastic production and keeping fossil fuels in the ground is a critical element, perhaps the critical element in addressing the climate crisis. So what is that life cycle we talked about? Uh, it starts with fossil fuel extraction and transportation, moves to production and manufacture. After uh, the plastics brief life as a product, it moves to disposal and plastic waste. And finally, ongoing impacts in the environment. Extraction and transportation for, of fossil fuels, the first step in the plastic life cycle, uh, produces significant greenhouse gases as Professor Howarth uh, described. Uh, this includes emissions from uh, methane leakage and flaring, the fuel combustion and energy consumption used in the process of drilling for oil or gas itself for motors or for trucks. Uh, and then finally, land disturbance, when forests or fields are cleared for well pads uh, and pipelines. And this is an often overlooked source of emissions, but it's really important to, to keep in mind, especially as some of the primary infrastructure built for um, fossil fuel extraction then gets used for further deforestation down the road. We estimated, again, using extremely conservative assumptions that in the United States alone, uh, emissions from gas extraction specifically produced uh, and attributable to plastic production were approximately 10 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Globally, uh, again, using conservative estimates, we estimated about 108 million metric tons of CO2 per year are attributable to uh, oil production for plastic specifically. But again, uh, because of problems with data or undercounting of things like emissions or compressor stations, the true scale of upstream emissions is unknown, but likely much, much greater. The second stage of the plastic life cycle, uh, refining and manufacture, it's among the most greenhouse gas intensive industries in the entire manufacturing sector. And it is the fastest growing, which is of grave concern if we're going to meet Paris targets. Uh, emissions come from the cracking of alkanes into olefins. This is uh, turning those, those molecules that come out of the well into the kind of molecules you need to make plastic. Then there's the polymerization process where they string those new molecules into really, really, really long chains that are the base of plastics. And then finally, other chemical refining and manufacture processes to produce the additives, the plasticizers that go into what ultimately become these plastic resins. To, to make the point clearly, this is a, uh, a chart from the US EPA, um, which shows that the bulk chemical sector uh, was the largest energy consum uh, consumer in terms of uh, industrial sectors even more so than refining or mining or cement and glass. And, and plastic um, is not all of bulk chemical, but is the, is the lion's share, both for the plastic itself and the precursors. And in 2015, emissions from just that first part, that cracking process alone, just to make ethylene, the, the primary but not the only base uh, molecule for plastics, or approximately 200 million metric tons of CO2 per year. And those emissions will only grow as, uh, as this expansion continues. In terms of disposal, 
the, the next stage of the plastic life cycle. Plastic is primarily landfilled, recycled, or incinerated, each of which produces varying amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. But the, the real driver of emissions from the disposal uh, of plastic is in incineration. Uh, in the United States in 2015, emissions from plastic incineration were approximately 6 million, 5.9 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Globally, and, and I want to stress a difference between these figures, globally, emissions from the incineration of plastic packaging waste totaled 16 million metric tons of CO2. But these are, these are net emissions in that second figure. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind when we're talking about uh, incineration, that when you measure the greenhouse gas impact of burning plastic, you can do it in two ways. You can either say, you know, just, just look at how much carbon dioxide is being emitted from the stack, or you can look at the net emissions. If you uh, are capturing some energy from that uh, incineration process, you can sort of assume that that would uh, displace some other energy production on the electricity grid and, and really just look at the difference between, you know, uh, plastic burned to make some amount of energy and the amount of energy that uh, a gas-fired power plant would emit. And plastic is dirtier than even burning fossil gas when combusted, which is to say that those 16 million metric tons are in addition to all of the other emissions that would have been there for the energy system to begin with. And then finally, these estimates don't account for open burning of plastic and a, sub a substantial amount of incineration that occurs with no energy recovery, which is to say that those emissions are not offsetting anything on the electricity grid, and they're also extremely difficult to quantify because they happen informally, they happen in communities overwhelmed by plastic, primarily shipped from the global north, uh, and are extremely difficult to account for. So our friends at Gaia uh, produced a three scenario analysis. The red line at the bottom is our best case scenario if plastic packaging production and incineration is actually halved by 2030 and, and um, phased out by 2050. A no growth scenario in the rate of waste incineration but continuing uh, growth of plastic. And finally, the industrial outlook. This is uh, this top yellow line, emissions from waste incineration, net emissions from waste incineration, uh, with energy recovery in a situation where the industry expands its production as they intend to and the role of incineration expands along with it. And if that is allowed to come to pass by the year 2050, uh, incineration will emit over 300 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents uh, above and beyond what would be emitted from the electricity grid. What does all that mean when you put it together? Uh, last year, we estimated that emissions from the plastic life cycle were equivalent to approximately 189 coal plants, 189 500 megawatt coal plants running 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. By 2030, if the trends continue, we will reach almost 300 coal plants. And by 2050, that would be 2.8 gigatons emitted annually, uh, over 600 coal plants running round the clock. Putting that all together, that, that amounts to about 56 billion tons of CO2, or between 10 and 13% of the remaining carbon budget by 2050, just from the plastic life cycle. And again, this is just estimating out to 2050. If this comes to pass, it, it wouldn't just stop in 2051, uh, and the emissions going through the end of the century would, would likely be extraordinarily higher. And this is represented in this chart you see on the right. Um, the, the bottom chunk is the emissions from resin and fiber production, and the top slice is emissions from incineration. Um, but I want to I wanna halt on this for a few minutes to, to point out a few key dynamics here. First is that, again, emissions from incineration are those net emissions, which means that the emissions uh, in the bottom chunk that are from the electricity grid are not in that top slice. So if you imagine a world, the world that we need to, to build together, where we are phasing out uh, 
fossil powered energy for the electricity grid and completely decarbonizing it, you would see emissions from that lower, um, from that lower wedge uh, start to flatten. But you would see emissions from incineration increase proportionally because those net emissions would be relatively so much worse compared to electricity coming in from the grid. Second thing is about the actual limits of how flat we can make that lower wedge. Um, because plastic is fossil fuel in another form, it is extremely emissions intense in its own chemical processes. The, the extraction of the fossil fuels, the transportation, the leakage, the cracking and polymerization processes which use hydrocarbons, which themselves are greenhouse gases. Uh, one estimate suggests that at best, even if all of the electricity put into the process and all of the energy put into the process is renewable or zero carbon, you can only eliminate about half of the emissions from that um, uh, cradle to resin emissions. Uh, so you can only cut that lower wedge about in half. But even that is optimistic because it requires so much energy, uh, heat and intense energy to, to do uh, these manufacturing processes, the cracking and the polymerization, that many plastics or petrochemical facilities have captive power plants on site, meaning that they are, they are drawing some electricity from the grid, but they are also uh, hosting a captive, usually gas uh, power plant at their facility, which is to say, even decarbonizing the entire electricity grid, we would still have gas-fired power plants uh, at these uh, manufacturing facilities, creating emissions that are insulated from other efforts to decarbonize. All of which is to say that at current levels, greenhouse gas emissions from the plastic life cycle threaten the ability of the global community to keep temperature rise below 1.5 degrees. And if this comes to pass, if, if that amount of production is allowed to come to pass, there is, no, there is no getting out of these emissions. You may have noticed that uh, that was only three of the four stages of the life cycle. But there's also plastic in the environment that we need to consider and, and really grapple with. Um, the Earth's oceans have absorbed uh, 20 to 40, approximately 30% of all anthropogenic carbon emitted since the dawn of the industrial era. And Evidence suggests that plastic in the oceans may actually interfere with its ability to absorb and sequester, uh, sequester more carbon dioxide. Um, this is the oceanic carbon sinker, the biological carbon pump, essentially plankton at the surface ocean, uh, like, like plants and small animals, pull carbon dioxide in uh, from the surrounding water or carbonic acid from the surrounding water, and then through uh, excretion or, or death, small amounts of carbon make their way down into the deep ocean. And that moves some of the carbon dioxide that's been absorbed down into the deep ocean, taking it out of the primary carbon cycle, allowing for more carbon dioxide to make its way into, into the oceans. But what we're seeing is that microplastics in the ocean may interfere with that. Um, this is a, a, a heat map of where microplastics are found uh, in the ocean. There are places where it's worse and where it's better, but as, as we're coming to learn more and more, it really is everywhere. Uh, and we're seeing that these microplastic particles are uh, damaging the phytoplankton and, and interfering with the respiration and reproduction of zooplankton, potentially disrupting this uh, foundational component of marine food webs that also serves as a key uh, oceanic carbon sink. And again, I don't want to overstate this, but I really don't want to understate this because uh, we don't have good estimates of the uh, emissions impact that this is having yet or the disruption of marine food webs, uh, which, have, which are important for a number of other reasons. Um, but I also, I really don't want to understate it either, in particular because microplastics are so difficult, if not impossible to clean up that again, if we allow this production to continue and to increase, the damage may have already been done by the time we know the true extent of that damage. So high priority actions to take now include ending the production and use of single use plastic, stopping the development of new oil, gas, and petrochemical infrastructure, 
fostering the transition to zero waste communities, implementing extended producer responsibility programs as a critical component of circular economies, and adopting and enforcing ambitious targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from all sectors. Now, as, uh, as Lisa mentioned, I want to pull us into the modern crisis now. Um, a few weeks ago, we published another report, Pandemic Crisis, Systemic Decline, uh, which discussed how the COVID-19 crisis exposes and exacerbates fundamental and systemic weaknesses across oil, gas, and petrochemical sectors. And I, I am sure I'm over time already, and I don't have time to go into everything, but there are a few key pieces that I really wanted to pull out. First is that fracking has been and continues to be a profound financial failure. The engine of production that this uh, surge in investment in new production capacity is premised on has been losing money year after year after year. This is a um, account of North American exploration and production company bankruptcy filings uh, through the first quarter of 2020. As this crisis hits, we're about, and, and uh, a number of debt maturities come due, what we are about to see is another wave of uh, oil company bankruptcies like we haven't seen uh, before all while a financial sector which has been supporting this industry which has been losing money year after year is growing increasingly intolerant of those losses which is to say that the the uh, one of the core pillars of this petrochemical expansion is a house of cards that is already in the middle of collapse second is that plastic itself is an increasingly risky bet for these oil majors uh, i talked before about oil or about um plastic being the growth strategy for these companies, but I really want to hammer that home. If you look at this uh, line graph, it's the right graph on the larger graphic on the left. It's from BP's 2019 energy outlook. And what it's showing is liquids demand, which is essentially uh, everything from ethane all the way up to the highest um, molecule components of crude oil, basically all the liquids um, that aren't the actual methane the fossil gas. What they're showing is in the green, uh, a trajectory where the world still cares about plastic, but you know, action isn't too swift and significant. And we see demands for liquids uh, continue to grow. And in the yellow, that's where a global phase out of single use plastics occurs by 2040. And there you can see demand for liquids declining, which is to say that in, without changing the projections for gasoline or jet fuel or, uh, any other use of hydrocarbon liquids, single use plastics specifically, are the difference between a growth scenario and a contraction sh scenario for these companies, and they know it. But even in a situation where they're able to produce them, the profits may not be there. This graph on the right is from ExxonMobil's 2019 fourth quarter results, and it shows the margins uh, on plastic, in particular polyethylene, being just cut down razor thin. Uh, just to, to make a case in point, ExxonMobil's chemical segment posted a quarterly loss in the uh, fourth quarter of 2019 for the first time in, I want to say, 17 years. Uh, and as the COVID crisis continues to roil, we're seeing the, the spreads on all sorts of plastic being completely cut down. We're seeing the price of all resins just uh, following the trajectory of oil prices and, uh, and dropping to rock bottom. So I'll, I'll end by saying um, we are now in this remarkable position where the industry is expanding like it's never been before, uh, but it is, never, it is financially uh, weaker than it's ever been. Stopping the expansion of petrochemical and plastic production and keeping fossil fuels in the ground provides the surest and most effective path to reducing the rising climate impacts of plastics and meeting those Paris Agreement targets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, that was uh, very uh, a lot to digest, I think, and um, many people don't think about all these impacts of every single stage of um, a plastics life cycle when you know we we buy stuff and then, and then throw it away. So I think it's uh, still a, an important work that we have to do to make these, these connections. And thank you for your clear summary on um, 
how the, 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 the expansion of petrochemicals is neither compatible with climate goals nor um, financially viable in the long term and especially shaken up now with the crisis. Um, please uh, have a look in, um, in the chat. People also shared links to the report, um, the, the hidden costs of plastic. So I, I invite you to have a look at those if you're interested and want to, to know a little more because I had to, to cut off Stephen because we have two more um, inputs and, um, and a panel discussion that's still coming up. Um, so we are now going to hear from Andy Georgiou. He became involved in the anti-fracking uh, movement when an international oil and gas company requested a permission um, license for shale gas development close to where he lives in Germany. Um, he works as a full-time freelance campaigner, consultant and activist for climate and environmental protection and also works as a policy advisor for Food and Water Europe. Um, he has extensively worked on the Fracking for Plastics link together with the Breakthrough from Plastic movement. And he's now going to enlighten us a little bit more on transatlantic supply chains and how the fracking and plastic industries are um, interconnected across the ocean. So please, Andy, the floor is yours. You're still muted. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, thanks, Lisa, and, and welcome to you all. It's amazing to see that we have over 150 uh, people attending this webinar. Um, you already had a lot to digest, and unfortunately, I, I have to kind of like still feed you a bit, uh, but I try to make it fast because I also want to get to the panel debate, um, which should be very interesting. My role is to um, make it a bit more tangible. Um, if we want to call it that way, and to zoom in into one company that has played and, and still plays a very dominant role um, with regard to the expansion of, of the fracking for plastics link. You've heard quite a lot about um, the problems we have in terms of, of extraction of oil and gas through fracking and also the problems we have with the full life cycle. Uh, climate impact of, of plastics production. Um, I want to again zoom in and, and, and tell you about a specific company um, that has tried to, to make a fortune um, with the fracking for plastics business model. Um, this company is struggling right now as it was back then in 2008-2009 when they came up with the idea of switching from NAFTA which is crude oil as a raw material to produce virgin plastics to what the industry calls wet gas. Um, and these are the mentioned components of ethane, propane, and butane. The audience, um, and, and to make it a bit more complicated, um, when, you, when you drill in, into a shale layer, um, you'll, you'll find different components. So when we talk about gas, we mostly mean methane, and, and this was explained in, in full detail. This is what the industry calls the dry gas component of the gas. So the industry can use, or we all as a society can use methane either to produce energy or the petrochemical industry can, can use it as a raw material to produce fertilizers. The other components that you might find in, in shale layers are ethane, propane, and butane. And, and these are the so-called wet gases uh, within the shale. And there are certain shale formations that are pretty rich in these wet gases. And the Marcellus Shale Formation in Pennsylvania is one of them. So Ineos, um, back then in 2009, uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, was struggling because the, the whole structure of the company is based on high debt and acquiring more debt and more debt. So they were struggling and, and they had to think about whether or not they, they will have to close down um, facilities. So this is the time when they came up with the idea of switching from NAFTA to frac gas in the United States, simply because of the fact that the fracking industry in the United States has operated in a closed market, uh, prices have collapsed. And so the fracking industry has found through the petrochemical industry and through the plastic industry in particular, new markets to expand. So there was a glut of, of wet, cheap wet gas. Um, and any of thought this is a good, good idea. Um, so they've started to commission uh, 
uh, an extra class of ships, and these are the dragon ships that you see right here. Um, they were built in China, and since 2016, they are traveling back and forth between the United States and Europe um, and provide. Andy? Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, were you not wanting to share your screen? Yes, I. <laughs> because it's totally. lovely to see you, but we cannot see any slides. You're absolutely right. Sorry about that. Okay, it's, it's working. There we go. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You haven't missed anything, so it's just the first slide still. Um, so these are the ships that I've mentioned. Uh, sorry again. They were commissioned uh, and, and constructed in China. And since 2016, they, they drive back and forth between the United States and, and several um, petrochemical facilities of INEOS. Um, what you see in, in, in um, together with the ship in the background um, is a puffin. Um, and you might be able to, to see some things in, in the stomach and its plastics. The reason for that is that we, we have um, a colony of puffins, which are endangered species in the first of force. Uh, the first of force is in Scotland and it ends basically um, where Ineos has one of its largest uh, petrochemical facilities, it's the grain smells facility. And this is where, where the ships are also bringing the frac gas from the United States. And scientists have found out that um, these birds, um, they do pick up microplastics, uh, mostly um, plastic pellets that have littered the shores of, of the United Kingdom and um, they end up dying from this. So this is what, what the picture is all about. It's, it's the story that, that I want to tell you in a nutshell. Going or, or reminding you again of, of what Stephen have, has just said, it's very important for all of you to understand that the petrochemical sector, in particular the plastic sector, plays a major role in, in concerning the contribution to global warming, but it's completely under the radar of, of the whole um, climate debate. And that's also the reason why we're doing this webinar here. So as a reminder, according to um, a report by the International Energy Agency, The Future of Petrochemicals, published in 2008, Petrochemicals are about to rapidly become the largest driver of global oil. This includes wet gas uh, um, consumption, and this is ahead of trucks, aviation, and shipping. Today, the chemical sector is already the largest industrial consumer of fossil fuels, accounting, again, as of 2018, for 14% of global oil and 8% of gas primary demand. And the International Energy Agency also expected in late 2018 that this cheap ethane consumption will grow by 70% until 2030, in part due to the expansion of US exports to regions such as Europe. And this is exactly the wave that Ineos um, tried to, to ride. Um, I, I put in expected because as, as Stephen has already highlighted, um, none of us knows what the pandemic will do in terms of, of the financial scheme for the fracking and plastics industry. But one thing that it does is that it reveals um, a sector that was already operating on, on very shaky grounds. Going back to INEOS, um, this is what the company looks like. Um, it's a very complex um, structure um, and I'm, I'm gladful and thankful to my colleagues um, from Food and Water Action um, that they've tried to, to kind of like create a graph that gives us an overview of the company. So at the core of the company, you see Ineos Limited, uh, which is based on the Isle of Man, a tax haven. Um, and around the core, you see companies based in, in Switzerland, also partly because uh, the company wants to avoid paying taxes. Um, the real interesting thing about Ineos, apart from, from being a pioneer in the switch from, from uh, crude oil to, to frac gas, gas is that 
the company itself started as a pure petrochemical company and, and transformed through this decision to, to switch to ethane, also transformed to an upstream producer of oil and gas. Um, they wanted to be the biggest wannabe fracker in the United Kingdom. Um, they're still the owner uh, um, or, or they're still owning a majority of shale licenses in England and, and Scotland. But in, in, in both regions, uh, fracking has been put on hold through moratorias. So this was one interesting thing to see um, over the last three years is that this company has transformed again from a downstream producer of plastics to an upstream producer of oil and gas, trying to gain control over the full life cycle of plastics production. And the other very interesting thing about Ineos is that it is basically owned by one man, and this is Jim Ratcliffe. Um, he was the richest man in the UK. He's not any longer, but he's still one of the richest men in the UK. This map here um, tells you, again, the story that you've already heard, um, but there are some more details. So back in 2012, um, they've commissioned the ships. Um, they've also signed contracts with US companies, 15-year uh, contracts um, with range resources, a fracking company from the United States, and also with Sunoco, um, who's a daughter company of energy transfer partners. This is the company behind the North Dakota pipeline. And the idea was and is to, um, to get access uh, over this period of 15 years and maybe also beyond to the cheap fracked ethane from the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania. Um, Pennsylvania has really been a major fighting ground um, concerning fracking. Before 2005, there were just a few wells in, in Pennsylvania and over a time span of a decade, uh, we, we talk about over 10,000 wells in Pennsylvania. This alone gives you an idea of, of what shale development means in, in former uh, rural areas. Um, the, the, the pure industrialization of the area is, is horrendous. Um, so the idea is and was to, to get the frac gas from Pennsylvania through a, an existing pipeline called the Marina East One pipeline um, that needs to be expanded, but also they also need to construct a second pipeline, the Marina East Two, in order to get this gas to the Marcos Hook facility, which is here uh, in Pennsylvania. And from there, Ineos ships the gas to the Grangemouth facility that was mentioned in Scotland and Norway. Um, whenever construction is being put on hold um, or there are any kind of, of major disruptions in, in Pennsylvania, we see the Enios ships um, distributing the, the frac gas from Houston to either Grangemouth or Raffness, or sometimes they have uh, simultaneous shipping from both sides. Um, the new plants uh, include um, the construction of, a, of an ethane cracker at Antwerp in Belgium. Um, and Antwerp, uh, some might not know, is the second largest petrochemical cluster in the world after Houston. So it's a very important uh, um, site, um, the most important petrochemical cluster in Europe, I would say. So the plans are to build the ethane cracker and it's all reliant on a supply chain of frac gas from the United States. And there are further plans to then also use Antwerp and a storage tank at Antwerp as a hub to then also redistribute um, the frac gas to other um, main facilities of INEOS in Germany. Now, when you see, when you look at this, this map, it's, it's kind of like, you know, um, it looks clean and, and you get the information, but what I want to highlight it, what this actually means on the ground for the people. And I also want you to uh, kind of like um, make you sensitive for, for what it means uh, when, when we talk about an end product that is being produced with frac gas uh, coming from Pennsylvania. During the construction of the Marina East 2 pipeline ex and the expansion of, of the existing one, um, the partner of Enios Sunoco 
was fined first uh, fined in, in uh, 2018 $12.6 million for ongoing violations against environmental health and, and, and safety regulations. This was one of the largest single find um, ever, um, um, ever commissioned uh, or ordered uh, by the Department of Environment in, in Pennsylvania. But this was just the beginning of the story because it just goes on and on and on. This is um, from August 2019, another find $330,000 um, for uh, Marana East construction violations. Um, this is from 2020, January, Lake Spiel earns Marana East pipelines, another 2 million fine. Um, this is most recently from February, uh, Pennsylvania approves $200,000 fine and orders remaining life study of leaky 89 year old Sunoco pipeline. And as an overarching uh, uh, issue, uh, the FBI has also opened an investigation into Governor Wolf's administration's issuing of the Marina East pipeline permits. Um, but all that doesn't matter to any of state. They've even complained towards uh, Pennsylvania authorities um, when the construction was put on hold that they might risk um, creating some stranded assets. So all the environmental and climate aspects um, are not really relevant for any the only thing that is relevant is to get access to cheap raw materials to produce more virgin plastics and this happens at a time when we've all acknowledged that a we have a major problem with global warming and b we have a major problem with um, plastic uh, waste plastic pollution and also the the climate impact of plastic now since Enios was blocked from really developing uh, fracking for plastics in the UK, they have now recently announced um, that they want to start, they themselves want to start fracking in, in Texas. Um, this has um, happened last, no, it's this week, May, May 4th, the announcement. Um, they are targeting the Austin Chalk Formation, which is also apparently uh, very rich in wet gas. So again, it's, it's not, it's not even not even about um, securing um, energy supply uh, for diversification. This this whole scenario is, has only one purpose: to defeat the fracking for plastics business model of Ineos. Um, Food and Water Watch and, and Food and Water Europe um, published three issue briefs on on Ineos. Um, one of them looked into their environmental record at all their existing petrochemical facilities in Europe, and, and it's very bad. Despite all the uh, promotion and everything that Ineos says otherwise, they even try to downplay these, these uh, major accidents that take place on a regular basis. And we're talking about gas leaks, explosions, fires, and so on and so forth. But Jim Radcliffe says, um, and this, is, this was a real quote, he said that, yeah, you know, sometimes you have a puncture in your, in your car and sometimes we have accidents in, in the petrochemical business. This is how, how this man wants to downsize the actual impact of his business. Another major problem, and apart from, from the climate issue, um, and for me personally, this, this only became very vivid and tangible when I was there on site at Antwerp, is that this, um, this whole sector, not only Ineos, but the whole sector has a major structural problem and it's a constant uh, loss of plastic pellets. So they're losing their first product and, and which, is, which is like insane uh, to believe that this can happen, but it happens. And it happens on a major uh, scale. What, what you see there, the, the, the white tiny uh, pellets, these are all virgin plastics. We're not talking about plastic waste of an end product. This is the first plastic product. And, and the, the, the spot that you see right there is a Natura 2000 uh, protected site. And no one does anything about it. There you are again, you can see it much clearer. But nonetheless, this company has the nerve <laughs> to, to, to have a, a big slogan on, the, on their new ships um, that they're planning to use to, um, 
have engineered before to transport raw materials from Antwerp and Rotterdam to Cologne. Um, to put this big slogan on their ships saying that keep our rivers clean while they're not taking uh, one cent of uh, responsibility for the ongoing pollution that they're producing on a daily basis. And that's of course one of the reasons why we have major opposition at all their sites, no matter if in the UK, uh, in the United States or in Antwerp. Uh, and this is what gives me hope. Uh, and this is what, what keeps me going because I know that together people are able to stop the expansion of petrochemicals and, and people are able to cut this unholy uh, alliance between the fracked states of America represented by the $1, which is not worth much, and the petrochemical industry and in Europe, in particular the plastics industry, represented by the 500 euro note, which is uh, just as worthless as the $1. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, we had a very nice comment in the chat that um, our insights are eye-opening even for um, some activists that have been active in the field for a while. So um, we are glad that we could provide um, that insight and unveil some things that are still under-researched and under-reported. Um, our last panelist for tonight um, is Bon Hernandez, and I hope that he has not fallen asleep by now because he is over um, in the Philippines and it's really late for him. So a big thank you already to you, Bon, um, for, for having been willing to accept the invitation, even though um, it's not a very convenient timing for you. Um, so after having looked at Europe and US and relationships, we will now um, see how this impacts uh, people in, in the Philippines and how um, yeah, other countries in the global south uh, also have issues with the petrochemical industry and also global warming at the same, at the same time. Um, Von, before taking his uh, latest assignment as a global coordinator of the Breakthrough from Plastic Movement, he was also a global development director of Greenpeace International, and he has co-founded different alliances such as Gaia. So please, Von, the stage is now yours, and please try to, to make it short. I'm sorry, we are way over time, um, just to, to allow some questions for the panel at the end. So I will ask you to start your video. Thank you. There he is. He's still awake. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, having me uh, uh, to be, um, you know, to join this webinar, uh, which uh, seeks to explore the connections between uh, uh, climate and uh, petrochemical uh, expansion and plastics. Uh, actually, I have to say at the outset that uh, there's been uh, talk uh, from some quarters that you know the concern over plastic pollution uh, is crowding out uh, the more urgent concern about uh, climate change uh, and of course this is not true because as you heard from our uh, earlier speakers uh, and presenters uh, issue of plastic pollution is sort of like the flip side of uh, climate change uh, uh, both are spawned by our dependence on fossil fuels uh, and and uh, uh, um, basically, they're sort of like uh, ugly twins, right? Uh, ugly children of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, I only have a few uh, slides uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to share uh, with all of you. And hopefully I can go through them rather quickly so I have more time. Uh, question uh, and answer. Hold on. So uh, I am um, the global coordinator of Breakthrough from Plastic. As Lisa says, uh, I'm based in the Manila, Philippines. Uh, Breakthrough from Plastic is a global movement uh, that was uh, uh, founded uh, about uh, more, a little bit three years ago uh, in, by around 60 uh, organizations from around the world, but that number has now grown. Uh, we uh, membership, uh, that includes more than 2,600 uh, organizations globally and uh, seven thousands, thousands of individual supporters. Uh, and as a movement, uh, we are committed uh, to uh, securing a future that's free from plastic pollution. And we have an agreed strategy on how to get there pretty much in broad strokes. It's about changing the dominant or uh, existing pro-plastic narrative, uh, which reinforces the demand uh, for uh, more plastic 
Uh, it's about promoting real solutions uh, to uh, the waste and plastic crisis, which uh, uh, is focused and anchored on uh, zero waste. Uh, and it's also about changing uh, corporate behavior. Uh, and what you see in this, um, in this uh, particular slide is really the different stages of the plastic life cycle, which was also covered. Uh, uh, to uh, work in synergy with other movements uh, such as the climate movement and our strategy has uh, um, in over the last three years has focused much on what we call the demand side uh, of the equation and we've been uh, working to expose uh, for example the purveyors of uh, uh, single-use plastics uh, in particular uh, retailers and fast-moving consumer goods companies uh, who, because of their uh, uh, brands, are vulnerable to uh, public pressure. Uh, but now I think it's becoming apparent that we uh, also need, uh, you know, to, because of this holistic approach uh, to the plastic pollution crisis, we need to address the supply side. Uh, and this is just uh, a, a graph that shows uh, the exponential uh, projections or growth projections of plastics that uh, if we allow current trends to continue uh, by, uh, uh, as you've seen from 1950s, uh, uh, the, that growth rate has, has been quite uh, phenomenal. Uh, and if we allow present growth rates to continue by 2050, uh, current uh, uh, production of plastic would quadruple. Uh, and uh, if you look at the 70 year track record of the plastics industry and you see what's what has happened to all those plastic uh, uh, waste that has been generated as a consequence uh, less than 10 percent has actually uh, been recycled and if you talk about effective recycling i'll go to that uh, point in greater detail later it's even lesser uh, than uh, the nine percent and then uh, uh, part of it is incinerated otherwise transformed into toxic pollution or uh, more greenhouse gas emissions and uh, a big chunk accumulates in landfills or ends up in in nature um, so the elephant in the room is that even if we you know try to uh, let's say uh, convince um, many uh, fast-moving consumer goods companies uh, or retailers to move away from single-use plastic. Uh, the problem is uh, from the supply side, uh, that production uh, trajectory is still uh, growing, right? And as already pointed out, the uh, key growth areas uh, for plastic production would be in the U.S. Uh, because of the fracking boom. Uh, and Middle East also and in North America, they share a uh, competitive edge uh, because of this, they, they were able to diversify. Uh, and, and China, which is now the uh, world's uh, biggest chemical producer, was also uh, looking at investing in uh, transforming coal, uh, for example, to olefins, given that they have uh, lots of coal supply. Uh, they wanted to see how they could, they could transform that into plastics as well. So that was some of the earlier projections. So, um, and all this uh, uh, expansion, uh, much of the expansion that we have seen uh, is taking place in, in the U.S., as mentioned by uh, Stephen in the Gulf Coast, uh, and also in uh, Ohio Valley, uh, about uh, uh, 200, more than $200 billion uh, in terms of expansion uh, uh, plans and development. Uh, and where is that uh, going? The plastics, uh, uh, produced from all this petrochemical expansion plants or projected uh, to be produced by this uh, uh, build out, 40% uh, of that is going mostly to packaging. Uh, and of course, there are other plastic applications, but if you look at the uh, most problematic and the ones that's, that's giving us uh, uh, real problems in the oceans uh, or, you know, uh, also for for the environment and causing uh, uh, serious environmental harm uh, to wildlife and to humans, uh, it would be uh, single-use packaging. And this is an example of where uh, all this plastic is ending up. But uh, of course, the, the target uh, 
uh, area for growth uh, is Asia Pacific, uh, given that you know you have a burgeoning or a, a rapidly uh, expanding middle class. Uh, so this is seen, this is seen as the uh, primary growth area, or I shall we say, uh, the consuming where where they expect to see increasing uh, consumption uh, of uh, disposable plastics. Uh, so we we our our markets our stores are flooded with what you see in this image of you know sachets we call them. These are single use uh, multi layer uh, single serve. Uh, pouches uh, they can you know serve you coffee sugar uh, uh, shampoo uh, soap uh, condiments uh, noodles uh, in single serve uh, and uh, therefore also disposable uh, containers they, these are not recyclable and then and if you do a, a cleanup or let's say you know a uh, a cleanup in a beach cleanup or in the community uh, you'll find that most of the uh, waste would be uh, sachets, you know, because nobody bothers to collect them. They're, they have no value. Uh, but the companies uh, that sell them love them because, you know, their brands are displayed on the, on the package. Uh, so in the, in, the, in the traditional stores, uh, 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 they love that, you know, uh, uh, they have so much high bad visibility. But that is also a vulnerability for them because we can then associate the pollution with the brands. So if you look at the uh, growth plans of industry, they have produced 855 billion units of sachets uh, 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 for Asia in 2019, and they are looking at expanding that to 1.3 trillion units uh, in 2027. And keeping in mind that this is not recycled, uh, that's all uh, eventually going to end up in, in the ocean or in being incinerated or landfill or in dump sites. Uh, and what we've done in Bakery from Plastic is, like I said, uh, we've highlighted the global brands that are responsible for, uh, uh, you know, uh, perpetuating uh, this dependence on uh, this single use, single serve plastics. Uh, and these were the top 10 uh, polluters uh, coming up from our, what we call global brand audits. Uh, so this is a typical waste audit where we added uh, the uh, methodology of actually counting the brands, uh, you know, thousands of volunteers all over the world uh, cleaning up their communities or their coastal areas, their beaches, and then identifying the top polluting brands. Uh, and we, th we thought, you know, by focusing on, on, on the brands that we would also then begin to uh, uh, impact the narrative around what's really driving the passive pollution crisis, and at the same time also uh, affect uh, the supply side of the equation. Uh, as I said, you know, what happens to all the plastic waste uh, that is uh, produced and uh, our markets are being flooded with all this stuff. Uh, uh, what's effectively recycled is actually only 2%. Uh, there's a lot of downcycling going on, uh, meaning you're simply uh, suspending the inevitable uh, because uh, after they uh, transform into a low qu lower quality product, they inevitably become uh, a waste uh, and, and a significant part of it also uh, ends up in, in the environment. As a result of our work, uh, and it's not just our work, but also uh, uh, what's happening in many other places, uh, there's been a lot of uh, focus on the story uh, around plastic pollution. Uh, this has become like top of mind issue uh, in the last three years or so. Uh, and public opinions around uh, plastic are shifting. The industry uh, was predicating its growth plan on you know, Asia as a future growth market and also targeting millennials or young people uh, uh, thinking you know, that uh, these people would continue to uh, you know, believe or uh, subscribe to this culture of convenience uh, afforded by, uh, by plastic or disposable plastic. But that uh, climate of opinion on plastics is changing. You know? And in fact, uh, uh, as an indicator of that change, more than 100 countries already have adopted some type of legislation to re regulate plastic bags or single-use plastics. Uh, actually, uh, this number has uh, grown. Uh, the latest edition was China, uh, who also uh, came up with a uh, recent pronouncement that they would be banning single-use plastics. India also came up with similar, uh, the Indian government also came up with a similar statement last year. So 
uh, there is serious momentum gathering towards really restricting uh, uh, single-use plastics, and as a result, uh, 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 looking at you know the uh, the environmental devastation associated with plastics, the potential human health uh, impacts uh, 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 associated with plastic, the financial risks are mounting. Even the insurance industry has uh, acknowledged that you know uh, there's uh, growing reputational and financial uh, risk associated not only with plastics but also investments related to plastics and we already know that this has been happening in the case of oil uh, and as uh, jim kramer a well-known cnbc analyst said uh, oil stocks are already in the death metal phase phase uh, and they're considered like the tobacco and uh, advising investors to move away from them so this is uh, direction and how has industry responded uh, uh, they uh, of course uh, to continue justifying uh, production and to continue to try to mesmerize the public uh, to uh, rely and demand uh, single use plastics they say we can recycle them you know we can continue we can invest in recycling or convert them into roads or convert them into fuel uh, which is all bad news for uh, the environment and the climate, uh, and we know that uh, 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 that 70-year 70, 70 track record does not. Uh, I think it's very clear uh, that uh, all this uh, uh, talk about recycling being part of uh, being the savior uh, for the industry is all uh, half half there. Uh, also, uh, uh, can you please sh slowly come to an end? Please, yes, Vaughn, so that we can have some questions. Thank you. Yeah, fossil fuel companies uh, together with the petrochemical affiliates have uh, combined together uh, as an alliance to end uh, plastic waste, and they've invested uh, actually one and a half billion uh, to uh, help manage uh, plastic uh, waste that's ending up in the oceans. This is a pittance compared to, let's say, uh, 200 billion that they're spending in expansion, and the fact that, you know, if you uh, one recent study estimated about 40 billion US dollars in, ter in terms of externalities as just associated with marine plastic debris. So really nothing. Uh, so let's look at bringing it back to current realities uh, before the pandemic. Uh, they were uh, banking on uh, uh, continuing demand originating from Asia Pacific. Uh, and uh, like that we've already uh, uh, covered in the US, uh, because of the fracking boom, uh, they have the competitive edge, uh, and and many Asian companies are also looking at uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions in the U.S. to take advantage of that boom. Uh, China uh, was uh, wanting to embrace coal to olefins production. This was pre-COVID, uh, uh, and uh, now looking at you know what has happened uh, since then, we are looking at you know recession. Uh, uh, on the horizon with a prolonged slump in demand. There's a supply overhang, which means it's bad news for recycling. Uh, recycling cannot compete uh, with the, uh, cheap uh, oil. Um, and, and right now, there's been a temporary surge in demand for single-use plastic because of uh, health-related concerns. Uh, we hope that this is only temporary, but keeping in mind also that industry has been trying to capitalize on the current crisis to, uh, to you know, using fear-mongering to justify why we need single-use plastics, ignoring the science that the coronavirus can, own, can, can, can remain on plastic surfaces uh, uh, for three days uh, also. So there's, uh, there's been a lot of play to try to create this demand, uh, capitalizing on the crisis uh, to justify continued production. Despite that, there's been lots of delays and cancellations in, in new facilities and petrochemical project construction due to labor constraints and also the demand uncertainties. And as we, we've already pointed out, Climate change and plastic pollution will not go away, and governments have already made commitments uh, towards uh, uh, reducing greenhouse emissions and also eliminating single-use plastics. So uh, the writing is on the wall, uh, and uh, uh, I think what we want to see is really a future where we walk away from uh, this type of uh, uh, scenario. I'll end there, Lisa. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Vaughn. And I really apologize. We just have gone way over time because all your inputs were so interesting and I didn't want to cut you off. And I hope that all the participants could nevertheless uh, benefit from what you have said. We have uh, quite a few questions, so uh, I'm afraid I will obviously not be able to ask all of them. Um, but um, what has been very evident is that um, a lot of people became very, very much aware of all the problems that are associated with both um, the, the, the upstream and the downstream of plastics, and yet we are unsure of the solutions. So I would really like to redirect the discussion now on, on solutions. Um, so there were questions around um, whether divestment can play a, an important role, um, how uh, important is recycling in the future, and maybe um, a technological advancements in recycling, how about, bio, uh, how about biodegradable plastics? So many questions around possible solutions. And I would suggest to start off with um, Bob uh, about maybe potential solutions to uh, decrease emissions um, upstream already. Are there any readily available technologies and what could policy possibly do to help implement them? And there was also a, a chat question that um, got a, quite a lot of likes and you or a questions and answers question um, that you would like to answer live. So I will just give you the floor, Bob, for um, yeah, potential solutions right at the extraction of the fossil fuels. Sure, no, that's an excellent question. You know, the upstream emissions, they're, they're globally significant, and yet it's a, it's a small percentage we're talking about, you know, 3%, three, 4%, three numbers less than that. Can, ask me to start my video, huh? Can industry reduce those? Yes, but it's expensive, and you're you're dealing with an industry that uh, you know, shale gas is already a money loser in the United States. And so, how do you get a, a these companies, which are are already just leading money to the world, to, to invest a little bit more to, to to capture it? Even under the Obama administration, you know, they were proposing regulations to reduce methane leakage. Uh, I thought it was it was much too little. It relied on voluntary compliance, voluntary reporting by uh, industry without any independent verification. And quite frankly, the oil industry is not known for an industry you want to trust for without independent verification. So I, I honestly think we're much better off putting our efforts into just moving away from fuels as, as quickly as possible and moving into to renewables. So one of the other questions was, you know, what do we do to keep the earth well below uh, two degrees, below 1.5 degrees? And in order to do that, we really need to reduce uh, carbon dioxide and methane emissions by about half in the next decade and by uh, completely by 2050. And given those targets, let's not muck around with trying to fine tune how to make shale gas not quite so bad. I think we just need to get rid of it and move on technologies are there and can do the job, but we really need to move it that way. Thank you. Um, maybe our members of European Parliament would like to jump in with um, a couple of thoughts and, and comments on how the EU intends to, to tackle methane emissions. Um, is there anything in the pipeline and what does EU policy mean for the planned expansion of, of Ineos? Do you have any, any insight on that? either Jutta or Martin, and if not, that, that's okay. We can all do our own, own research on that as well. No, sorry, I, I, just, um, I just didn't manage to, to hit the right button. Actually, the, the commission is at least, at least taking the first steps um, addressing methane emissions. Um, they will launch a methane strategy, actually. Um, of course, this is very limited, so to speak, because, um, they are very careful and reluctant. And for, for the time being, they're only thinking about counting the emissions. And for me, that was a deja vu because I'm a rapporteur in the European Parliament on the maritime emission files, which is also right about counting only. And we are now trying to give it a push into actually reducing and pricing these emissions. And so we would, of course, very much like to see some more um, teeth in this methane strategy. If you're afraid to do pricing right away, then how about certification saying, okay, you can um, have 
different certificates of different methane suppliers um, if you can prove that you're tackling your methane emissions along your along your supply chain then you might um, get an I don't know a certificate and you'll get an e certificate if your methane emissions are very high so that would at least be a start because honestly though i don't see the european union facing out um fossil gas within the next five years but just a short addition to switch on so a short addition from from my end and um this is kind of the, the methane emissions of the of the fossil gas outside of Europe are uh, the tiny dirty secret. Yeah? And what we heard today was very much focused on the US shale gas. And I don't want to dampen the problems we face there, but what we have to also understand is that uh, we have completely unknown and potentially even massive big, or bigger problem with the uh, Russian gas no one actually really knows when i was trying to discuss this with the industry uh what they know uh they don't know they're only guesstimates now as you pointed before uh the copper nucleus is giving us some data and they're not looking very good and i think this is a issue that what we have to watch out for is that we address on the european level uh all the gas that we don't only try to limit it to the american or the russian that we actually really look for all the gas because you know Azerbaijanis are not also in an ideal situation Saudis are not really ideal situation so this is something where we have to capture the outside world and I think what is going to be crucial fight on this is around um, in my view the carbon border adjustment because we bringing lots of it in and this is something where I think we have to be uh, looking at how used to use it to capture also the methane emissions. And I think this is something where it will be very interesting to say, and I think this is, see what is gonna be the impact. And I think this is where we can have leverage. Yes, the commission is not super keen, but sees that there is need to do something and uh, a lot of pressure will be needed. Thank you for these European insights. Does the American side briefly want to comment on how that, um, carbon border mechanism uh, may be implemented. Is that something that um, is talked about in the US? So either Stephen or, or Bob, do you want to briefly comment on, on that as, a, as one of the pol possible policy solutions and how you see uh, the discourse developing on that in the US? Uh, I'll let Stephen comment on it if he likes. I'm, I'm only loosely familiar with the, how it might act. Yeah, I also, I'll, as, as someone who's not especially familiar with it, I don't want to speculate too much. Um, yeah. I, I think what you're hearing is that those of us in the United States are not hearing too much about the proposal, and therefore we haven't thought much about what it might mean. Yeah, there are still a lot of debates going on on that issue here in Europe as well. So we will see how that develops. We will keep our uh, our eyes open on that issue. Um, maybe some last words um, because time is time is running um, on the potential role of of recycling and other solutions to tackle both the plastic and and the climate crisis. And we hear a lot of nice things about that. Stephen, do you want to comment on some of these uh, solutions? Uh, chemical recycling, recycling overall, bioplastics. What is your stand stance on that? Yeah, I think the. The, the most important takeaway, and I also think Vaughn probably has a lot to say about this, um, is just source reduction has to be the solution. Like there's no way to recycle our way out of this crisis. There's no way to use weird, essentially plastic refining, whether you call it chemical recycling or pyrolysis or waste to energy or waste to fuel. The, our false solutions, bio-based plastics. Again, if you if you do the math on trying to replace all of the plastic we have now with plastic that's bio-based and you start actually counting how much space that takes up, it's, it's astounding and devastating. Not to mention that bio-based plastics still have all of the problems of plastic once it becomes plastic. So it's, it's again, not, 
none of these are full solutions or, or silver bullets or anything like that. Um, recycling and traditional mechanical recycling has a role to play, of course, um, in, in managing the circular economy. But, but again, it, its role is to capture the parts of the economy that can't be dematerialized out of plastic, right? That, that a lot of these solutions um, have to come in after the main solution has been implemented, not as the way we get ourselves out of this. Same thing with just uh, direct substitution. The, that, and I know I sound like a bit of a broken record, but really source reduction just has to be the key, whether that's stopping you know, fracking, stopping ethane crackers from being built, uh, redesigning products so that they don't use plastic packaging, or redesigning entire product systems so that they're based on reuse and refill. Thank you. Bon, do you want to add on to that at all? Um, I think uh, Stephen already um, mentioned what I wanted to say. I mean, uh, really what we're encouraging companies to do is invest in alternative delivery uh, systems or models. Uh, so we don't need the plastic packaging, but come up with you know a mechanism or a system where we can avail the product, but without the associated uh, problems. Okay, and maybe one very last question, because I think that's very uh, interesting and we hear a lot about, a lot of talks about hydrogen and uh, synthetic gases. Um, uh, Fabian Preger asks, um, we also should talk about methane from synthetic ga gases. Methane stays methane, whether from fossil gas or from hydrogen gas, syn gas. Um, Bob, do you want to comment on that? Yes, that, that's a good point. You know, methane can from biological sources, so we can, can have manure digesters and we can make methane, but it's still methane if it emits to the atmosphere. Hydrogen can come from uh, fossil fuels, from gas, or it can come from renewable sources. I would like to see, to, to the extent we use hydrogen in the future, it should come 100% from renewable sources and we should keep it as hydrogen, not convert it to methane. It's uh, we, we can, hydrogen's a great storage product, it's a great energy product, but converting it to methane uh, causes all of the same problems, again, even if it originates from renewable sources. So I think that's an excellent question. Yes, thank you. So I'm afraid, looking at the time that I have to wrap up, I hope that you could all gain some new insights. So we looked at the upstream part of the supply chain of plastics that are consumed in Europe with um, a great input from, uh, from Robert Haworth explaining why methane emissions have been um, so underestimated and, um, and, and biased in, in research. We got a better understanding of the entire climate uh, impacts overall, overall the entire life cycle of plastics thanks to Stephen's intervention. Um, and a better sense of um, the role that EU and US fracked natural gas trade has played in the expansion of virgin plastic production, um, especially in the case of, of Ineos, uh, thanks to Andy. Um, and we saw that this is a global problem with an intervention from, from Vaughn as well, um, in a time where we really cannot lose time anymore. We cannot even stay um, at the current emissions, but we need to finally start decreasing. Um, and also tackle the plastic uh, pollution problem. And Europe, as, uh, as one of the leading importers of liquefied natural gas, has a, a purchasing power on the global market, which should not be underestimated. <clears throat> so um, we really need to finally start uh, thinking about petrochemicals and climates together. One cannot be solved without the other. Um, and uh, infrastructure that is being planned right now, which goes beyond 2050, uh, should, not, should not happen as this uh, does not go hand in hand with the, uh, with the EU Green Deal and all the nice objectives that were outlined there. <clears throat> so um, we also heard some of uh, the, the alternatives. They do exist. Some policies would be readily available, some technologies as well. But first and foremost, um, it is about reducing um, in the first place. Um, and we cannot recycle our way out of the, neither the climate crisis nor the plastic pollution crisis. Um, there was 
uh, a question on uh, whether uh, the three LNG terminals that are planned in Germany have some connections with INEOS, and that would have been a question for Andy as well. But I would redirect that question to our next webinar in that series, which um, is taking place on May 13th, um, together with Deutsche Umwelthilfe again. Um, as you are all here, you have also um, gotten the invitation to the next uh, webinar. Robert Howarth will um, again speak about the methane leakages and climate impact of gas, and we will have several members of the German Bundestag to debate on the on the role of, of Germany in global gas markets. So I cordially invite you to join that webinar as well. Um, if ever you had friends that could not attend, uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available to you shortly. So thank you everyone for, for joining in. Thank you to all the, to all the panelists um, all over from the Philippines to Europe, uh, to, to the US. Um, I really enjoyed debating and I will definitely uh, keep on informing myself further on all these complex issues. Um, so good night to the Philippines, have a good Thank evening you. in Europe and have a good day in the US. Thank you, Lisa, for your great Thank you, Lisa, thanks everyone. Great job, oh, you can thank you. Thanks. Switch you. on the cameras to say bye. <laughs> bye. 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 <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, you bye. Week, Stay safe. Thank you so Stay much. Healthy. Bye.